controller fixer codependent was the original word that I, I found and began to understand what codependency was in my life. Um, and, uh, so I'll just say again, my name is Vicki. I saw that recording little sign come on. So I don't know if they caught my name, but, and yeah, I did title my talk reorganization and, uh, I've just, you know, yeah, I've been going through such a, such a, a year, <laughs> such a year of like change and digging. And, you know, it really came to me, it really came about because I saw that there was some things in some ways of living and interacting with the world that just really weren't working for me anymore. And I knew that, I knew that transformation was possible. I had seen several people's lives completely transform and, um, through a process of recovery and surrendering their life to a power greater than themselves. And, um, in, in this group, we're going to just talk about, uh, power greater than ourselves as, as being God. So that's how I'm going to refer is just to God. And I think it's important for each of us to come to our own understanding of who God is. And I really love that process and the way that actually Alcoholics Anonymous outlines it in such an intentional way. And I feel that it's, it's, it's accessible for everyone. Um, but you know, the biggest, the best example that I can think of, um, for me, it, you know, it's that I wanted to lay a, a solid foundation. Uh, and I feel like I did that over, you know, the course of 10 to 14 years of doing different things. We, there was transformation that happened in our lives. There was growth that happened in our marriage. There was deep healing that happened inside of me and restoration. And it was like just one, you know, we often use that term of the layers of the onion. Uh, but when disaster strikes, we can really see where the cracks are in our foundation. And uh, an example that we have in our life is um, we were actually hit by a tornado at our home. And a couple of years ago, and uh, my mother-in-law had been saying, um, oh, you, you know, you're going to have to think about taking this tree down. Uh, you know, it's getting, it's, it's dying. Here's some evidence. This tree's dying. The neighbor kept saying to us, are you going to cut that tree down? Like, oh, it sheds so much dirt and garbage. It's always dropping stuff everywhere. And I thought, but no, that tree is beautiful. One week out of the year, it's beautiful and pink. And the rest of the year, that tree was like dropping crap all over the place. Um, and my neighbor hated it. And so we're like, well, feel free to cut off the limbs that are reaching over your fence. Um, but you know, I like it and I want to keep it as long as I can. I'm really attached to this tree. And then I see that my fence is getting, it's falling down and our retaining wall at the back, we back onto a field and the retaining wall was crumbling. And a friend of ours is um, a roofer and he had come over um, to look at our roof and said, you know, you're going to have to do your roof. Like in the next couple of years, you're going to have to do this roof. And so we were like, oh no okay, put it off, put it off. Like, I don't want to do it yet. And, but he's, he's warning us, you know, you got to do this roof. And then the, the, um, this tornado comes through our, our neighborhood and tears a strip, like right over our house, like across the field and over our house. And the funniest thing was I, we were at my brother's and I was making fun of my brother because the tornado warning came and he ran to the basement with his kids. And I was like outside looking, oh yeah, it's bright and sunny over here, but there's some dark clouds over there. And you know, ha ha ha, you're hiding in the basement with your kids. Like, I think it's fine. And then my phone starts to blow up and all of these people are texting me. Are you guys okay? You know, we saw Lonsbury on Twitter, like your street got hit by a tornado. And I was like, what? I'm not even home. So we got home. And there are, is like emergency, you know, everywhere, fire trucks, all the neighbors are outside, everybody's outside, trees down everywhere. And the interesting thing was that especially all the weak fences were down, you know, and so my tree was in my neighbor's yard, the neighbor who hates, who hated the tree. My tree is like right in his yard, our fences down, our roof, you know, our shed that looked fine. Our shed is on its side and all these different things, you know, where we're like, oh dear, now we have to fix all these things. Thankfully we have insurance, but that is really such a good example for us of even what happened last year with the pandemic right? This pandemic hits. Now we're all in this like intense crisis mode. 
and we start to see the cracks in our foundation. You know, maybe what originally didn't seem like that big of a deal now starts to, I start to see like, oh, uh, maybe I'm using this as a coping mechanism. You know, when we look at alcohol sales, when we look at, you know, all these, when uh, one huge example was um, Pornhub, Pornhub gave free memberships, people like, and they, because they got so many members in the first, I forget how many weeks of the pandemic. And then they started giving free, like, you don't need to give free memberships. It already skyrocketed, but you know, they were just totally taking advantage of the fact that people were hungry and looking for a means of escape. People were looking for something to bring them ease and comfort in what was a really chaotic, uncertain time. And so it's so important that I have a solid foundation because when a tornado rips through my neighborhood, I want my house to still be standing. When disaster strikes in my life, I would, I want my house to still be standing. But the thing is that I actually can't do this on my own. And so for me, my kind of personal disaster struck about eight months before the pandemic, I, my job ended and I was really excited to take a year off work. I'm going to take a sabbatical and, oh, it's going to be so lovely. And I'm going to have so much fun. And it actually hit me right deep at the core. I had no idea how attached my identity was to my job and where I worked and the, even just having a job. Right. And I would have told you that I wasn't attached to my job. I would have told you that my job didn't define me, um, but being busy really defined me, whatever it was. And so all of a sudden having all this empty space in my life, that was a tornado that struck. And I realized that my foundation wasn't solid and cracks that had already been there um, really started to be exposed. Um, when I want to go into a process of reorganizing my life and doing an internal reorganization, if I want to do a deep overhaul, it's actually really impossible to come to do that by myself. I can't do a deep overhaul. I can't, I can't. And to be totally honest with you, I can't even effectively do a spring cleaning in my home by myself, like the actual physical clean. I can't do that by myself. And so what makes me think that I can do this deep internal overhaul by myself? Um, so what I really wanted transformation. There was stuff that I was like, this can't continue. You know, I'm having conflict over here. I have all this insecurity over here. You know, I'm reaching for this too much or I'm escaping over here too much. I just can't keep doing this. And a lot of it for me was internal unless you lived with me, you didn't really get to see it as much, but what's become a real strong value for me over the last year is that I actually want my inside to match my outside. I want what's happening inside me. Um, sorry. Yeah. Whatever I'm presenting to the world, I want that the, to reflect the reality of what's happening inside of me. So if I can't fall asleep at night because I am like just obsessing and I can't put down these thoughts, um, that doesn't match, right? My, this exuding, attempting to exude peace on my external. That's not good enough. I can't just keep it together externally. I want to actually have that peace internally. So, um, as we go through the, you know, if, if we enter a, a recovery program and we go through the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, um, we learn our powerlessness in step one. And then um, we go through this like process of recognizing, I actually can't do this by myself. I need to do this with someone else. And so as I got into my step four, which was, um, it was really, uh, it was really, really important for me because I wanted to do such a thorough job. And because I really came to believe that God actually could do this big work in me, um, and I loved the fact that this program taught me that actually, I don't have to take my problems to myself anymore. I can actually take my problems to God and all of my problems are his to solve. He has the power to be able to solve these problems. And that means I don't have to like be way down the road thinking about like, oh no, what am I going to do? I have to get a job or I have to fix, figure out this, or I have these problems. I can just peace. I can peace my peaceful. I can. <laughs> take myself to a 
peaceful place every morning when I wake up and say, God, I give all of this to you. And for me, I journal it, you know, I, I, this is the problem that I feel is looming on the horizon. And I give this to you. And this is, I'm worried about this relationship or I'm worried about this person. And I'm obsessing about something that I said to somebody two days ago. Um, would you just take this? I am completely powerless to fix my own problems. And I get the power to do that through doing this work through staying. And for me, I, at the beginning, I made a commitment of six months. Okay. I'm committing to this workshop. I'm committing to this study. I'm committing to something so that I'm not alone and I'm going to do it. I'm going to do this for six months. And every time doubt would start to come in, I would just say, Nope, finishing this. I'm finishing it. Maybe it's not the be all and end all. Maybe this, whatever I'm doing isn't perfect. Maybe something else starts to look better. It doesn't matter. I made a commitment and I'm sticking to this for six until it's over. That was so huge for me because I'm a quitter. I <laughs> always want to take the easy way out. Um, and so I have learned over the last five months that I can take my problems to God and they're his to solve. And also, as I was doing the work, I, I learned that in doing my step four, I wasn't doing a step four to learn more about myself. I can do a lot of self-help and self-care and all these self things. I, I had like a lot of head knowledge, but it didn't help me. I, I actually needed to, to get into this deep connection with God and a deep connection into this commitment that I had made. And that's going to unblock me. That's going to unblock me. And then I will get power from outside of me. Like, you know, if the answer has to come from inside of me, I'm screwed because I've been working on this for a really long time. I've done a ton of stuff and had a lot of head knowledge. So I needed something new and I stay unblocked by staying spiritually fit. So there's spiritual practices that I've implemented into my, into my life. I light a candle and I sit in peaceful silence and I created a lot more open space in my day. Um, it's really challenging because I, I don't know about an addict or an alcoholic, but as an Al-Anon, as a person who who's codependent um, and, you know, likes to create a lot of chaos to keep myself busy. I came into this work numb, not, really aware of my feelings and not really able to identify my feelings. And so this was a challenging process of letting my feelings come up and sitting in them and experiencing them, learning to name them um, and not just go to my thing that is gave me escape from my feelings. And so I had to, I've had to do a social media fast. I've been off Facebook, closed my Facebook account. Um, I think for seven weeks now, um, because it was just like this escape where I could just scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll and scroll. I had to take a break from reading novels, um, I, because I would escape into a novel and I would, I could, I could power through a novel in two days. And that's a great excuse for not doing the work that I, that I've said I'm going to be doing, not getting my homework done. Um, I love that, you know, in doing this work, it's, it's like, I'm, it's root and branch, you know, we're, we're, we're like, I can trim it. I can trim a shrub. I can, I can trim a tree, but I need to like pull this, these weeds in my life. I need to pull them out from the root. And so I need spiritual practices to give me the strength to pursue that and to, to persist through that. And so, um, that's been really, really huge because, through this work, there's actually been some huge emotional displacements in me. Um, it's tough. It can be really uncomfortable. It can be really hard, but there's also like some reorganizing that's happening and some rearrangement. So maybe I won't react to somebody the same way that I used to react in the past. And then I need to celebrate that. Um, maybe I believed something about myself that I've realized isn't true, but I can so quickly fall back into that belief. Um, and so I need to keep bringing that back to God. And some of them are just like suddenly gone. You know, it's just like all of a sudden I realize like, oh, wow, I don't do that thing anymore. And then others are a little bit harder. And I, I don't, I can't worry about that. You know, 
for me, irritability is a big one. Like I'm an irritable person to live with and that's hard for the people around me. And so I have to be patient with myself. I have to be more patient with myself than the people that I live with. They're patient with me, but I have to be even more patient with myself because I am, I promise you way harder on myself than anybody else is on me. And I obsess and I get stuck in my head and beating myself up. And the words that I say to myself have so much power and it's not, it's not helpful. And so I have to stay in these practices every day. Um, the, it's, it's just, it's fascinating to me because this program teaches me like whether I'm doing it through, and I've really come to whether I do it through life lab whether I do it through Alcoholics Anonymous, whether I do it through Al-Anon, which is the family group of Alcoholics Anonymous, whether I'm doing it through an intentional Bible study, because I'm, I'm doing the six month Bible study at the same time, whether, you know, whether, whatever way it is that, that I'm coming at this transformative process, if I give my all to it and let God really instruct me, um, this, it really does work. I can be changed. I don't have to stay trapped in these cycles that I've been trying to break free from for so long, but I can't do it by myself. And this program isn't a, none of these programs are about understanding myself better. None of them. All of these programs are about understanding God better because I can understand all sorts of things about myself. Now I just have like truth slapping me in the face, like left and right. Right. So I'm just like swinging around with this truth, like just slapping me. What am I supposed to do with that? That's so heavy to carry. That is not what God intended. God wants me to take that truth and give it to him every single day. And so, and then coming to understand God better, then I can really begin to understand what God can do for me not what I have to do for myself. If I could do it for myself, I would have done it a long time ago. I know for a fact, if, if John could have done it himself, he would have quit drinking the first time he saw that it was a huge problem. He, he couldn't do it by himself. Um, where am I at? Okay. I think I have time. So I, 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 there's a, a concept that the, and I think it would be said to be true of an, an addict or an alcoholic also, but in codependency, one of the, you know, one of the biggest things that I really began to see is that I spiritually abandoned myself and I can't live that way. I've, I've, I really basically live a, 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 like as an orphan, you know, and so to live as an orphan that means that I'm constantly feeling rejected. I'm constantly feeling like a victim. I'm constantly feeling like I have to self-protect. I have to protect myself. No one's going to protect me. I need to do this, you know? And so I'm burdened and I'm, I'm driven by these fears. And it's like, I started going through this process and I see like, oh my goodness, I am just so stuck in these fears. Um, and so there's a section of the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that I wanted to read to you. Um, so basically what we're saying is that um, we're going to come to, if you, when you do the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, it says on page 63, we're now at step three. So step three is when we say to God, I offer myself to thee. You build with me, you do with me, whatever you want, relieve me of the bondage of self so that I may better do thy will take away my difficulties that victory over them may bear witness to those. I would help of thy power, thy love and thy way of life. May I do thy will always. And once I say that prayer, once I give my life to God and we do this in church, we do this in all sorts of places. We want to give our life to God. Um, we do this, we can't do it lightly. You know, this is a big, this is a big step of what is that actually going to look like? Um, and so we've gone through a process before this point of coming to understand who God is. And maybe we don't understand him perfectly, but we're just saying like, 
I can't do this by myself. And I need, I need your help. Who are, whoever you are, whatever you look like. I don't, I don't really get it yet, but I need your help. Then as I continue through the work, steps four through nine is it, it like, if I utterly abandon myself to doing steps four through nine, that is how those difficulties are removed. So I'm in step three, I'm just saying to God, like, this is what I want you to do, but I actually have to continue to do the work. I actually have to stay and I actually have to be committed. And so, um, uh, so next after step three, we launch out on a course of vigorous action. Um, the first step of which is a personal house cleaning. Many of us have never attempted though. Our decision was a vital and crucial step. So the decision to, to abandon, um, my thoughts, like the the decision to not do it by myself. That's basically what I'm deciding. I'm not going to do this by myself. I need someone else. Um, it's a vital and crucial step. It could have little permanent effect unless at once followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves, which have been blocking us. And in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, it says our liquor was but a symptom. We had to get down to causes and conditions. And for me, I read it as, um, my obsession is, but a symptom. The codependent can say, um, you know, a porn addict can say like my porn use is but a symptom or my eating is just but a symptom. Um, we can translate this book into like whatever category we fit in. Therefore we start upon a personal inventory, a business that takes no regular inventory usually goes broke. And how true is that of us as human beings? If I don't eventually stop and take stock of my life, you know, it can go like way off from where I thought it would go. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and, um, I'm going to skip ahead quite a bit. Cause so, so the thing that I, so what stood out to me is that, um, I'm building this solid foundation and I'm trying to like clean out. So where have I been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking and full of fear? And seeing how full of fear um, I was, was a shocking thing. When I actually started this, I actually told my sponsor, oh, I'm not afraid of death. I'm not afraid of death. Like, I don't like pain. And I, it, obsession is a form of pain for me. Um, and so I get tormented and I get really irritable, but I'm not actually afraid of death. It was really interesting what came out for me as I did this process, because I sat through, um, recognizing, oh, I am, I'm fearful. Okay. What am I afraid of? Well, I'm afraid of, for example, I'm afraid of looking stupid. So then I react. Why am I afraid of looking stupid? Because I'm afraid of what other people think. Why am I afraid of what other people think? Well, cause they're going to judge me. Why are you afraid of being judged by other people? Well, be, then they're not going to want to be my friend or they won't like me or they'll reject me why are you afraid of being rejected? I'm afraid of being alone. Oh, that was a big, you know, when that came, when I realized like, I'm afraid of being alone. So I'll stay with a drug addict for 13 years. Who's cheating on me and doing all these horrible things to me because I'm afraid of being alone. Why am I so afraid of being alone? There's a, there's a few different ways. There's a few different things that that brought up in me. I don't know. What if there's no God or I'm afraid of being alone because I can't do this life by myself being alone. I go to the depths of, in my brain, I go into this place of obsession. You know, I sit in these places of obsession alone is painful. Alone is like alone means I'm unloved. Why am I so afraid of being unloved? And it brings me back to this place of like, do I I don't believe I, I I'm not living my life. Like there's really a God who loves me. That's really where it led me. And that self-reliance fails me that I can't do this by myself. I can't do this by myself. I can't do life by myself. I can't do life on my own power. And so for me, um, 
that was a, was a, you know, that's the emotional part that came up where I was like, Oh, this is, this is heavy. Okay. This is heavy, you know, and this is where I start to want to escape. Ooh, I don't know that I want to do this. Like, I feel like I need to get a new, I need to buy a new novel. I should get a new novel. I should start reading a book. Oh, I should, you know, I, I should, maybe I don't need to be off Facebook anymore. I should actually go back on Facebook. Oh, I have to go back on Facebook for church. Cause I have to, I have to look at the church website and I have to, you know, be this responsible person who's like reaching out to people. Like a lot of my distraction technique is like, Oh, I should, I should message this person. I wonder how they're doing. I should check in with them. I should do something kind for someone else, anything to escape the pain that's happening inside of me because I don't believe that God can heal that pain. Now I do truly believe that God can heal that pain. So on the other side of these six, five, six months that I've been digging in deep and doing spiritual practices, you know, which to me, that just sounded like those holy people over there do them, you know, or that I was never going to be doing it right or be doing it properly. For me, what that looks like right now is opening my Bible and reading a chapter and maybe one verse will stick out to me. And I cling to that one verse. So the huge verse that stuck out to me this week, I saw that John, thank you. The huge verse that stuck out to me this week, as I was persisting through this, you know, hard, but so good and so life giving process. Um, a friend of mine was telling us about this chapter second Chronicles. I never even think, I don't even think I've ever read Chronicles. And she read a verse, uh, second Chronicles 20. If you've talked to me in the last week, I've probably told you about this verse, but <laughs> second Chronicles 20 verse nine says, if disaster comes upon us, sword or judgment, pestilence or famine. And she added pandemic, we will stand before this temple and before you God for you, your name is in this temple. And we will cry out to you, God, because of our distress. And you, God, will hear us and deliver us. And then down at verse 17 in the same chapter, it says, you do not. So this is God speaking to them. You do not have to fight this battle. Um, or some, no, sorry. Sorry. This is not someone speaking to them about God. You do not have to fight this battle. Position yourselves, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. He is with you. Do not be afraid or discouraged. Tomorrow, go out and face them, for the Lord is with you. And that verse, like, that verse was so impactful to me this week. Like, I don't do these big, holy Bible studies at this point in my life. I, at this point in my life, what I need to do is I actually need to position myself. I light a candle, I put on some music and I sit still. That's what I've been doing for like a year, just learning how to sit still. And so just even that thought of like, you know what, like tomorrow go out and face them and the Lord's going to be with you. And I'm like, ah, oh, okay. So today I just going to just going to sit still again. I'm going to put on some music. I'm going to feed my spirit. I'm going to open my Bible, pick something. And you know what, if I don't understand it, I don't understand it. That's okay. But the sitting in this for like the longer and day after day after day for like over a year now, I am starting to understand things are sticking. Things that were harder are getting easier. And so, um, that was my reorganization title. I don't know. It was like spring cleaning sort of ish, but <laughs> that's my week. That's my month. That's my, that's my year <laughs> in a nutshell. Thanks for listening.